And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Dr. Scott Taylor, who is an experiencer, academic, and educator that has served on the board for the International Association of Near-Death Studies and is the current president of the Expanded Awareness Institute. He has had a shared near-death experience that we're going to talk about today and more. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I am really pleased to be here. All right. If you don't mind, can we start on the day that you had your shared NDE and go from there? Sure. Um, So we have to go all the way back to uh, July of 1981. I was in love with a woman. Uh, Her name is Mary Fran. And she and her son, Nolan, had been out sailing um, on Lake Washington in, in southern Minnesota. And at the end of the day, they had wrapped up and were coming home. And as close as we can figure out, as she left the, the county road and turned onto um, a, a major highway, um, she looked into the sun. She was turning left and looked into the sun to see if there were cars coming and and didn't see as she was blinded by the light and um, pulled out in front of a car and she was um, killed instantly. It hit her right in the driver's side door. And her son, Nolan, who had just turned seven, um, he had a, a really bad head injury. And they took both of them to um, Rochester, Rochester, Minnesota, where Mayo is. So Mary Fran was one of nine children. And Nolan was the oldest grandchild. And um, this is important because it took six days for Nolan to make his transition. And um, in that process, Um, there was enough time for all of the relatives of Mary Fran and Nolan to come to the hospital in Rochester. Um, As you could well imagine, there were all the brothers and sisters, but there were boyfriends and girlfriends and spouses and uncles and aunts and, um, you know, um, parents, um, you know, all those that were on her family. And then my family came and so there was quite a collection of people who had um, made the trip to be there to support Mary Fran and Nolan. Um, I say Mary Fran too, because even though she was, was killed outright at the, at the scene of the accident, the, the people were, uh, the EMTs were able to keep her alive, her body alive. And, um, she was the donor for their very first heart transplant. So there are, there are some, some parts of Mary Fran and Nolan that are still out there in this universe. Um, but all of us were, were gathered in at, at Mayo. And what we had done is that we had set up this uh, rotating shift. Every two hours, two people would go and they would sit with Nolan. Um, even though he was in a coma, we know that the last thing to go is the sense of hearing. And so they were very clear to us that it would be important for Nolan to have us there and to have us talk to him. And so we did. So over the course of the next six days, um, the family was there and we just rotated through and we told him stories. And (laughs) so on the morning of the sixth day, um, uh, Mary Fran's oldest sister, Janie and I had the shift from 3 AM until five in the morning. And we were there and we were telling him stories about um, all (laughs) When you have that many people smashed into a little waiting room, um, it's really 
it, and in, in its way, it's quite humorous because all these people are trying to sleep and they got cushions on the floor and they're laying around all higgledy piggledy and, and, you know, they're, they're trying to make everybody try to keep everybody's spirits up. Um, so there were, it was, it was great kind of, um, humor that we were trying to impart to, to Nolan to, to keep his spirits up. Well, it got to be about quarter to five in the morning and Janie, who was a emergency room nurse, and she spent a, a ton of time in uh, trauma care. I remember this exactly because she went to the edge of the bed, to the end of the bed. And this is back in the days when there were clipboards and she's looking at, at, what the history, what his history is. And then she's looking at the, the monitors that are on either side of his hospital bed. And she just shook her head and said, Scott, we, it's, it's time. So we each grabbed a chair and we sat by Nolan's head and we told him what a, what a wonderful boy that he had been, that he had been, extraordinarily brave and that we could tell that he was fighting really hard to stay alive and be with us and be part of the family. But Janning went on to say that, you know, Nolan, if your mother comes for you, it's perfectly okay. In fact, it's a good thing that you would go with your mother. And I got to say the same thing, that he'd been a very brave boy and that we loved him dearly. And if Mary Fran came, <clears throat> if Mary Fran came to pick him up, that he should go. And so with that, we, our shift was over and we left and and went into the waiting room and, you know, another shift came in at five o'clock. Well, it wasn't an hour later when the nurse came in and she said, it, it's time. He's, he's fading. So all of us got up and we filed into um, Nolan's hospital room. And, you know, all of you have been in hospital rooms, they aren't that big. And so there's all these people, um, I'm guessing 40, 50 something like that. And we're all gathered in this hospital room. And as luck would have it, I was one of the last people to, um, to enter. And there was already four deep around the bed. So I sat on the windowsill next to Mary Fran's youngest brother, Willie. And we just waited. And, and you could see that the heart monitor, right? And it slowly, slowly, slowly um, went flat. And, and then there's that ominous sound when it goes flat. And, goes, mm. and what I witnessed at that, at that time was um, Mary Fran crossing the veil and coming up to her son and scooping him up out of his physical body. And there was this exquisite reunion between mother and child as only you can imagine. They had this beautiful reunion. And for some reason, I was able to take part in that. I felt it. It was an extraordinary um, set of emotions that were put into play. They were... Um, This, uh, this wonderful reuniting between mother and child. And then, much to my surprise, um, the two of them then turned to me and embraced me, and then the three of us went to the light. And while we were there, um, we got to... Um, be together and we communicated. Now you have to realize that this all happens non-verbally. Um, I was in the room to, with them, not in the room. I was in the light with them. 
And what we got to do is to, um, we got to express our love and affection for each other. We got to um, say our goodbyes. We got to just, <clears throat> we got to be there one more time together. And then at some point it seemed complete and the two of them turned and left and went further into the light. And I then left and returned back to my physical body. And that isn't the whole story because um, what happened to me was that um, when I, when I left and went with them into the light, I also was in the room with all of the other grieving relatives. I had, I now know I didn't have words for it then, but I had bilocated. I had two separate distinct consciousnesses that were um, um, present. I was present with Mary, Fran, and Nolan, and I was present in the room with all the grieving relatives. And I know this because um, what, what had happened to me is, you know, I'm up in the light and that space is just exquisite. It is filled, it is boundless with the love. And it's the love of the universe. And it was the love between Mary Fran and me and Nolan. And it was just so amazing. And at the same time, I am in the, in the room, the physical room with all of the other grieving relatives, because you have to imagine just moments before they had lost their, their friend, their nephew, their, um, their grandson their you know, and so, I mean, everybody in the room was, had their arms around each other. They were crying on each other's shoulder. Um, weeping in some way um, for the loss of, of, of Nolan. He was the oldest grandchild in this family of nine. So I'm sitting there on the windowsill and I am in this spot where I am filled with the love of the universe and it is trying to break out of me. It's how it felt. It was just the radiance that was me in that space um, was entirely inappropriate for the room because everybody had just lost Nolan and they're in this tremendous state of grief. And I'm in this state of euphoria. And the only thing I could think of to do at the time was to take my hands and, and cover my face so as to not betray um, what was going on. Because if somebody actually had looked at me, um, they wouldn't have understood. They would have misinterpreted what happened. And I certainly didn't want that to happen. And I mean, it was confusing to me too, on some level, because here I am, I'm in the greatest grief that I have known. And at the very same time, I'm in this place of extraordinary joy. So it's this remarkable fusion of emotions. And, and when I tell this story, some, sometimes I get choked up about it. And, and, it's, and it's not because of the loss of Mary, Fran, and Nolan. That's only part of it. The other is is that when I, when I talk about it, it's like I can touch that space again. And it's so joyous that, you know, you're... So it's this, it's this mixture of grief and joy, which is now just interlinked, um, for me anyway, of, of... It was like then it was, you know, I was in two places at once and I have these two very divergent feelings, joy and grief that are now, you know, in one space. And so 
um, I remained there for a while. And I don't know what a while is. Um, time is really funny on the other side. I, I don't know how, well, I do know how it works, but it's not the same as here. And so, um, five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't, I don't know, something like it felt like that. Um, and when I came back to my physical body and I could regain my composure again, I could, you know, take my hands down and, and rejoin, uh, the relatives in the room and, and be with them and share with them my grief over losing, um, Nolan. So, um, that, that's my story, Jeff. It's, um, it's a, it's a trip into the light. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us, Dr. Taylor. Did you have any interest in NDEs at all before this happened? <laughs> I had no idea. I mean, this is 1981. Uh, Raymond Moody had published his book only six months or six years before, and it really wasn't known. I grew up in, in Southern Minnesota, um, I grew up in the, in the tradition of the Presbyterian church. And I have to tell you in the lexicon of the Presbyterian church, they don't talk about this stuff, you know, that you can, in the moment of your greatest grief, you can be in your greatest joy and that you can witness people coming across the veil and scooping each scooping out of their physical bodies and taking you to the light. And I, all of that is, um, no, <laughs> No, I had absolutely no idea that this could happen. And, you know, one of the things I talk about with people who've had near-death experiences is, um, and it's a great word, ineffable. It, you know, it just, it just means you don't have the words to describe what happened to me. And, and I didn't because I, I mean, I've had 30, 40 years now of, of trying to wrap words around my experience and it's still, you know, I tell you, you know, I'm maybe 20, 25% of the way there. It is so hard to, to explain it. And one more thing that makes it even more difficult, um, you know, in near death experiences, there's three kinds of light. There's uh, the white light at the end of the tunnel. There's also black light and there's clear light. Um, we know a lot about the white light cause you've seen it all on TV. And I mean, you know, Harry Potter had a near death experience. I mean, it's, it's part of our culture now. And so, um, the kids will call that, um, the father light it's, it's big and bold and bright and it's filled with, um, love and compassion and, um, and you, you merge with that light. Um, the people that I've, that I've talked to in my academic research on near death experiences, a couple of them have been so present during their near death experience. When they were, when they entered into the white light, they turned around and looked to see if there was a shadow and there wasn't. It, it's an indication of how you become part of the light in a near death experience. There's also a black light experience, which is, um, you know, start right out there in Genesis. <laughs> um, before there was anything, there was the void. And that's what this is. This is, this is where the universe is before it becomes material. It's the source of everything. It is the most extraordinary space. Um, the people I've interviewed who've, who've had this experience, almost universally, when they start talking about the black light, they will cross their arms over their chest and they'll start to rock a little bit. And they'll talk about how they've been held in this and how they have been um, brought into the love of the universe, that this is the space before creation. Um, this, um, 
I've had some people beautifully say that this is the womb of God, black light experience. So it's a, it's a totally different experience than white light. Black light is this encompassing experience of the void where we all, where everything is before it becomes physical. And the third type is the type I had, uh, which is a clear light experience, which means, um, so, you know, wherever you are watching this, all of a sudden, if you had a clear light experience, what it would seem like is if everything in the room started to exude its own light. And all of a sudden you begin to realize that everything is made up of the light. Everything is connected because it's all of the same light. And that has extraordinary implications, but it's like, um, it's like, it's, it's like realizing that in the world of duality, I am different than uh, this microphone. I am different than Jeff. I am different than you. But in a clear light experience, what you realize is that we're all made up of the same thing. And as such, we are intricately connected to everything else. And that's how um, it was there in the hotel, or I mean, in the hospital room, is this sense of, um, of me merging with the light that is all around us all the time anyway. We just don't realize. It's like I just slipped into another dimension that takes has its space right here in the physical. Sorry, that was a long answer to um, your question, which I totally forgot. I believe in physics, they call this certain field the unified field. And it's like outside of our Newtonian physics. It's like in another dimension. But there's something there that connects everything. It's like a void that connects everything. Does that seem like that would have anything similar to being in the black light? So I like to describe the black light as this realm of potential where everything is um, exists free form. You know, if, if you like reading the old Testament, it talks about, you know, at, at the beginning there was the void and it was dark and deep. And then God said, let there be light. And, and so the light came out of the darkness. It, it came out of this space. Um, for those of you that are fantasy folks, uh, you could also think of it like the Star Trek replicator. You know, it just sits there and it's waiting for a command. And you say, you remember when uh, Jacques-Luc Picard, you always come up and say, Earl Grey, hot. <laughs> and, you know, and then out of the ether, there comes this cup of steaming hot tea. Well, it's kind of like that. There's just... Everything is waiting in potential and, and it takes intention. It takes thought. It, and then the universe like rebounds it back at you to create it. Um, so when people talk about um, the void, um, I have to be real careful that it, it isn't emptiness. That's a whole different thing. It is, it's a space that is filled with energy and potential. Um, it is the exact opposite of being empty. It is extraordinarily full, but of nothing in the physical. Um, and so it's that, I could see how that could be related to the unified field. Like all of us, um, touch that space all the time. We're connected through that source energy. Um, and all of us are connected to the black light, the clear light, the white light. We're connected all the time. So it's, um, yeah, that's one way. I, I like that actually, Jeff. Thank you. When you saw Mary Fran and her son, were they like 
light beings, like light human beings, or do they look like orbs, or what did they look like? Okay, so this is part of the ineffable part. Um, I would tell you that they were pure energy, that their signatures, I knew exactly who they were and what they were doing. Um, can I say that it was, you know, like being in a movie, you know, and, and seeing the physical form with Mary Fran and her brown hair and white robes? No, it wasn't like that. It was... Um, It was energy. It was Mary Fran's energy and coming in, scooping Nolan up out of his physical body. And then the two of them merging together. And then the three of us merging together. Um, that's harder to describe because they don't in that state, they don't really have boundaries. You know, not like we think of it here. We've got, you know, a skin and air and there's a, there's a boundary there. Was there any form? Not that I can describe. Yes, there was a form. Yes, there was a form. Hmm. Um, it was an energetic form. Um, was it like a ghostier version of our physical forms? No. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. Would it be like, and I'm sorry, words fail me here. That's okay. I mean, would it be like clouds of energy maybe? Yeah. Only more radiant and without the white. <laughs> when you all three were together. Yeah. Did you communicate with each other or were you just kind of sharing love and you had some kind of telepathic sense of completion and goodbye? Yeah, it was a it was a telepathic exchange. It was done without words. So it wasn't done in English. You know, I didn't say I love you, Mary Fran, and I miss you. And, you know, it, it wasn't like that. It wasn't that linear. Um, it was a it was an exchange of of beingness between the, the three of us. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, at, at Monroe, we talk about thought balls or gestalt, you know, where you, you get information and it, and it isn't lean. It's like it just all of it arrives at the same time and there's no beginning. There's no end. There's no sentence structure. You just know something. And, um, I've done that work so long that, um, I now trust that I didn't know what was happening to me then that was, you know, Monroe was a lot later, but, um, you know, when, when that happened to me, I didn't tell anybody for 15 years because hmm. I, I couldn't, I, I didn't, I didn't have words for it. I didn't have the cultural context for it. I didn't have the emotional context for it. This was so outside my experience. I didn't know what to do with it. And to be truthful, um, I didn't know how it'd be received with my family and friends and, you know, the community that I was in. Um, it was only later after I'd done my academic work I, I did my doctoral dissertation on people who've had near death experiences. And in that process, I, I learned vocabulary. I had experiences with um, meditation in Monroe and going back and um, discovering that you can, that you can enter into um, those states of consciousness where Mary Fran and Nolan um, reside and, carry on a conversation with them. And I have done that and I still do. I have an active uh, relationship with the two of them to this day. Yeah. In fact, Nolan's right about there. Hmm. <laughs> Did you learn anything on the other side? Anything that you can apply to your life? Let me, let me answer that question by saying that 
one of the side effects of having this experience was that I became intensely curious about all things spiritual. Um, something profound had happened to me, and I knew that if I had entered that place once, that I could do it again. And so I went on this incredible search to try to find a way to enter that space again. And oh my gosh, Jeff, I mean, I went, I went to the, well, none of this was conscious, but I was drawn to um, like the sacred sites, the ancient sacred sites of the world. I went to the Sphinx and the, the great pyramids at Giza. I went to the Oracle of Delphi. I went to Stonehenge. I, um, I practiced with shamans in both North and South America. I went and studied the, with the Omoto religion in Japan. Um, I, it, all of which I was, what I was trying to do was to find a way, like, is there some vestige of energy that's left over in the pyramids? Or, I mean, something that could help me get back to that way. And I tried different forms of meditation. Um, TM was my first one. Um, I did, um, I went to seminary. I mean, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I tried to, try to do this intellectually. And it wasn't until I went to the Monroe Institute and discovered their particular form of meditation that can dial in very specifically, um, you know, these vibrational energy levels where people who've made their transition, where they, where they live, that space of life between lives and, once I found that, um, you know, I could continue the conversation and I could, I wound up having the conversation in a way that I could more understand it. You know, I could use real English words. I could slow the conversation down enough so that I didn't, I didn't have to deal with that, that thought ball. So, um, so the, your question started with, you know, like, are there things that you could, that you can bring back? Um, yeah. One of the first things that I could, that I brought back was this intense curiosity about the world, because what I discovered was that the way the world worked, I thought, um, it doesn't work like that. I mean, how else could you bilocate? I mean, who would ever heard of that? I mean, I grew up in a little town in Southern Minnesota. We're not that far from Little House on the Prairie. You know, it just, it just, it, it just wasn't part of my frame. I, you know, at that point in my life, I had gone to college and studied business and economics. I went to Northwestern graduate school, got my MBA, was working for, um, Dayton's department store, which is now Macy's, you know, I had a very conventional upbringing of, um, you know, typical Protestant religion, kind of a leave it to beaver growing up and, and this business orientation. And now all of a sudden I'm thrust into a world where I can have I can communicate with people that are, that are dying, that I can have two separate consciousnesses. I can, um, what I learned was that in these spaces, that intention is everything. When you move into um, expanded states of awareness, and in particular, in that space where you can communicate with people who've passed, um, your intention or the intention of others, that's what drives experience. And 
and uh, sidebar asked me about come back to that um but i'm so so grateful for this eye opening where i began to realize that how we conduct ourselves how we think how what our attitude is how what our hopes and dreams where our heart is i think that's the key is where is our heart and and being able to say i would i want this to happen in my life so this intention that we have about who we are and how we exist in the universe it drives everything and so it has been um a lifelong quest for me to um to be present and that's really hard <laughs> you know hector tolle's book be here now you know really it's it's to be here now with who you are and and what what i wanted and for a long time what i wanted was to, to be able to experience that relationship with with mary fran and nolan the other another thing that i learned was um that time doesn't operate the same way there as it does here you'll hear indie years talk about that a lot that they were there and they lived this whole expansive you know big experience and yet when they came back to the physical world it 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 been just moments maybe seconds or maybe a minute but they would swear to god that they were gone for a month you know um and th- that certainly happened to me too because i felt like i was with them for a considerable period of time but i'm not sure how long it was in the physical and and so all of a sudden you know there's this sense of okay can i do something with that well we now know that people who um do remote viewing for instance um they believe this so firmly that there's no such thing as time or space you can be anywhere any when that you want to be and as a result because everything is connected to everything else all that information both past present and future here someplace else all of that information is available to us and and so um learning about how time doesn't exist has been a great benefit to me um as i as i begin to navigate both this physical world and the non-physical world those are those are two intention time another one might be all of the senses that we have here in the physical world exist in the non-physical world but differently you know like vision here we have stereoscopic vision in the non-physical world it's 360 you can view all the way around you you're not limited to just having you know and smells and tastes and i mean there's colors that exist over there that don't exist here in the physical but could they so you can actually bring those things into the physical world Okay, so here's the sum that I've learned over the course of 35 years. <clears throat> to boil it all down is that there are rules that work at play in the non-physical universe and there in the unity universe where everything's connected to everything else. Here in the dualistic universe where things are different from each other, we think they're separate. They really aren't. And here in the physical world, we can choose which set of rules we want to live by because both of our both of those dimensions exist simultaneously here right here in the physical and it's just a shift a shift of thought and you can enter into that space and to say you know what i'd like to know 
what's going on in London, England at the tower. I made that up. You know, what, what's going on there right now? Well, in your mind's eye, you can go there and see it. You can hear conversations. You can smell things that you never smelled before. Um, so you get your choice. And that's part of being present is which set of rules are we operating under right now? Are we using the set of rules for duality? Or are we using the set of rules that come from the unity universe? You get to choose. And it's a it's an extraordinary thing to learn. So there you go, Jeff. Have you considered why only you had this experience in this room full of people? And if so, has one of your considerations been that their love for you pulled you into this realm with them? There's a two-part answer to that. Um, <clears throat> and I very rarely tell this part of the story, but since you asked, um, part of my academic research into near-death experiences at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. St. Thomas is Minnesota's largest private university. Um, is that I had to go out and interview, I wound up interviewing 36 people in depth about their experience. And I put the word out and one of the people that responded was Mary Fran's sister. Uh, because she had had a near death experience. Um, she had had an adverse reaction to some, um, some medications, some drugs, and um, wound up having, what's our time like? How are we doing on time? Well, we got about a good 20 minutes left. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you. So I sat down and I had an interview with her. Um, and she chooses to remain anonymous. So I'm just going to keep referring to her as sister. Um, so we sat down in a normal interview function. I had my tape recorder there and I pressed tape recorder. And she told me this story is that um, she took her, med her medication, laid down to take a nap. And the next thing she knew, um, she was in this world of gray floating in this world of gray and out of the gray came Mary Fran and Mary Fran um, was quite insistent. She walked up to the sister and just pointed at her and said, you've got to go back and you got to go back now. And of course the sister looked at her and went, Hey, <laughs> nice to see you too, Mary Fran. And to which Mary Fran responded, I'm not kidding. You have to go back. And you have to go back now. And she said it with such force that it blew her back into her physical body. And when she re-entered her physical body, she opened her eyes just in time to see the EMT turn away from her and say to his buddy, I've, I've done all I can. I, I, we lost her. Whereupon the other... EMT happening to look at the sister, noticed that her eyes were open and, you know, jumped on her and they got her to the hospital and got her all cleaned up and everything. So it was a, a short near death experience, but it communicates a couple of things really vividly. One is that uh, personalities uh, still can come through. I can see Mary Fran do that with the pointy finger and everything, you know, I can hear her voice. <laughs> and <clears throat> so I was entirely consistent. But the other thing is about how they stay connected, how um, she knew what was going on in her sister's life and how important it was that she go back. We finished the interview. I turned off the tape recorder. I'm, I'm picking up my stuff. And then I had this thought which was saying to the sister, you know, something funny happened to me when Nolan made his transition. 
Um, you know, you were in the same hospital room as I was. I was sitting on the on the the windowsill. You were standing across the room on the other side of the bed. Um, did anything happen to you? And at this point, her eyes got as big as saucers. And taking that as a yes, I put the tape recorder down and I pushed record. And I said, I tell you what, you tell me what happened to you and then I'll tell you what happened to me. So what she told me was at the moment that Nolan flatlined, what she witnessed was Mary Fran coming across the veil, scooping Nolan up out of his physical body, the two of them having this incredible reunion, then the two of them turning to her, embracing her, and the three of them went to the light. She used the exact same words as I did in explaining what happened to me. It was exactly the same experience only happened to her. And so if I ever doubted that any of this was real, that belief was shattered in that moment because here the sister was independently verifying every detail of what had happened to me. The difference was um, when I say we, the three of us went to the light, it was really the four of us went to the light and I just didn't see the sister there or they happened at different times. I mean, that's that whole time thing. I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Did they bilocate and have a different experience? with the sister and have a similar experience with me. I don't know how that works, but it was, um, so there was somebody else in the room that had had that experience. And, um, it was, um, it was profound in its implications for me because you know, up, up until this point, I didn't have words to describe it. I was just starting on my, um, to do my research into near death experiences. And it was, um, I mean, it was so heartfelt. I mean, there's, there's two of us that had something quite extraordinary happen. And I wrote all this down. Um, it's in my dissertation. I distributed the dissertation to the other members of the Randall family. And um, so far, nobody else has come back and said, well, it happened to me too. So I know that at least, at least the two of us. And I'm sorry, Jeff, what was the first part of that question? Well, I believe you answered it. And I, okay. with time remaining, I need to move on. Okay. Now, you used to be the executive director for the Monroe Institute. I and did. You're, and you're into meditation and binaural beats. Can it be taught for us to have NDE-like experiences without dying? Yes. And how? Yes, it can. Um, it takes just a little bit of tweaking of the binaural beats to get us into the various vibrational states. Um, those of you that have done any research on the um, near-death experiences know that there's like 19 common elements that people experience in their, um, that they can experience when they have an NDE, um, you know, such things as, um, you know, the out-of-body experience and meeting your guide and the tunnel and the reunion with the dead relatives and the, and the meeting the teacher protector, the, the, you know, the, the guardian or the guide who then takes you and has a, a life review, the um, cities of light, which contain all of the universities, the reception center and the healing center, you know, all of that, that area of life between lives, um, you know, the area of all knowledge, all of those things have a unique vibratory state to them. And it took me I don't know, five years or something to be able to identify and tweak binaural beats um, enough that it's it's uh, much easier um, to enter, say, like um, the tunnel. There's an easy one. 
Okay. So you want to go to the tunnel and you want to explore the tunnel, which by the way, has, is amazing. There's just so much cool stuff in the tunnel. But if you, that has a certain vibratory frequency. And so we can now take you there and you can enter into the tunnel with a um, doing meditation. You don't have to have physical trauma. You don't have to have, you know, all of the, the confusion. I mean, there's a lot of people who find themselves in a near death experience and it's such an environment that is so foreign. They don't know what to do with it. I would say that's probably my case too. You know, I'm, I'm in this space and I'm with Mary, Fran and Nolan and we're exchanging communication, but there's so much more we could have done had I known what to do. So that's when I think, um, yes, um, you can use binaural beats to enter into these various vibratory states, say of the tunnel or the reunion or um, uh, the past life review, the life review. You can do that and, um, and you can do it. Um, it's really helpful to have a teacher, to have a guide, to say, look this way, turn left, up, down, move your energy level. You know, there's a bunch of things you can do. So you learn to navigate the non-physical universe. And, you know, the upshot of the whole thing is um, by the time you spend time learning about all of this, um, there's a, there's a course I teach. It's a week long where we do 25 trips into the non-physical universe. And by the time we're done with the week, you know, what your transition is going to look like, feel like, smell like, taste like you're going to know it intimately. And then all the fear of death just drops away. All of that wondering about what's going to happen just drops away. And you begin to realize that once you know that, that leaves you so free to live life here in the physical. Because we don't have to worry about what's going to happen next. You already know. So that just takes this whole weight off your shoulder. And you can actually start then to live this life more fully without having to worry about what's going on in the next one. And... Anyway, so yes, thank you for that that question. All right. Well, you mentioned that this course is on your website. What is your website called? Neardeathmeditations.com. Pretty straightforward. Neardeathmeditations.com. All right. I've seen you on YouTube and I forgot the name of your channel. What is that called? Near Death Meditations. <laughs> Are you branded How's that, that for subtle, huh? Is that your brand on everything like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? It is for now. Um, I'm launching a podcast coming up called the uh, Afterlife Files, and we're gonna we'll probably rebrand everything to the Afterlife Files, mm -hmm. but go with uh, near death meditations because that's how you can contact me. There's a contact page. The CDs are on there. You can do this at home. Uh, the course is on there. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's easy. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and just ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how should they contact you? Well, there's a, there's a couple of ways. It's easy through the website because there's a contact me button on there and you can just do it there. Um, if you're looking at me through YouTube channels, you know, you can make comments. I, I monitor those comments, um, you know, on a podcast, the same thing. If you make comments on the podcast, then, um, yeah, it actually uh, gives me great ideas for, uh, for, future, for future subjects that we can explore. So, you mentioned yes, please enter into a conversation. That'd be great. You mentioned that you have a podcast coming out. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? Oh, my Lord. Um, as you know, um, podcasts are a lot of work. <laughs> um, that's it for right now. Um, we've got, uh, well, no, that's not true. Thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, we'll have a second course coming up. Um, that's going to talk about how you can refine your communication with the, the non-physical universe. 
uh, for those who have passed over so that you can have a, um, a clear communication uh, with those that are on the other side based on your talents and abilities. So that's in the works. I expect that'll be out probably mid-2022. It, it takes a long time to develop courses like that to get them just right. So do you regularly have communication with Mary, Fran, and Nolan? Yeah, I do. Do you have to get into a meditative state to do that? Nope. <laughs> Not anymore. I used to. Um, but w- <laughs> um, I was Mary, Fran kicking in right there mm-hmm. saying, you're such a sweetie mm-hmm. for mentioning that. Um the uh, it's a learned skill, and like any other learned skill, you know, when you're you're learning to swing a golf club for the first time, lordy, you know, it's just like, uh, this is you have to watch your hips, watch your hand, what's the speed? You know, you got all of this you got to pay attention to. That's when you're a beginner, and then after a while, you know, it just becomes second nature, and then, um eventually it just becomes an open channel and you can have the channel dialed on or you can have the channel dialed off. And, and so that's kind of where I'm at now is that I can have um, communication with them, you know, take a deep breath and I'm there. Hmm. That's kind of my cue for it. That's, that's what's going on now. And it's been really helpful, by the way, because um, I'm not exactly sure who talks, but, you know, when you talk about um, heightening your intuition, I think that's one of the after effects that I had from my shared death experience is, um, you know, my intuitive sense um, just went up a couple of notches because um, once I, you know, open that channel up, um, there are more things that came through, you know, turn left, pick up this book, call this person, you know, don't forget to check your tires before you went on the long trip, you know, all that stuff. It, it just, it comes through and, and the more it comes through, the more I thank it, the more I ask it to come through, it, it, it just keeps building on itself. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I think that one of the greatest gifts that we are given by our creator is the gift of curiosity. And to be able to look at the world and go, why? Why does it work this way? Is there a reason for it? Is there, is there a reason behind it? Um, how, how can we express more, more love? How can we see things as, as uh, what I'm working on now is how do, how do I set my energetic template? So when I see difference in, in the world, I, I don't treat that as a threat, but I treat it as an enrichment and, you know, it's, it's looking at everything and going, is it really that way? Or is there another way of being that allows more of the love of the universe to um, be manifest through me? So um, my practice is to be curious. You know, I used to take, I taught Sunday school for a while and I used to take um, take them outside or, and, or rain, you know, and I, and I, here's a little cup. Here says, somebody loves you in Minnesota. Mm. And to sit there and go, okay, gang, give me 10 things you don't know about that coffee cup. You know, and at the beginning, it's like, uh, 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 and then you go, and after a while you get the hang of it. It's like, I wonder what the glaze is. Why is it somebody from Minnesota? What about white and black? And is there a special thing on the rim? How many ounces are in it? 
What happens when you break it? Is it a different color? You know, on and on and on. And once you start to look at the world and begin to go, what, what don't I know? What, what message can I learn from asking really good questions? Um, I think that's the part that is, it's just more fun than one person should have (laughs) is, is to open up that, that talent that's within all of us to go, really? I'm curious about that. Tell me more. So that's the one positive thing that I'm, I'm leaving with you all is um, curiosity, especially curiosity about love and its expression. I think our, it's, it's just a tremendous gift. Thank you for that message. And Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I really appreciate you and I wish you the best. Thank you, Jeff. And with you also, good luck with your, with your interviews. And I hope they bring you great joy. And to all of the people who watch this. Yay. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.